All right, let's get started. <clears throat> well, thank you for sticking around. Um, if I were not giving a speech right now, probably I would have wandered off myself and uh, grabbed some lunch. So thank you for that. Um, so today we're going to talk about our socket. Um, so first, introducing myself. Uh, my name is Andy Shi. I'm from Alibaba Cloud. Uh, we have an office in Northern California. Uh, it's an engineering office. So I'm an engineer working there. Also, I'm the developer advocate for certain open source projects. Um, about 10 months ago, we were introduced uh, to this fantastic technology called RSocket. And over the course, I learned that it's great for connecting devices. It's great for connecting applications, microservices, anything that doesn't involve a human being. Uh, it's great for. Um, so today, I'm going to share that technology with you. And hopefully, um, you can spread the words, and uh, I can get some feedback. Now, let's first talk about um, Oops. OK. Let's first talk about uh, the definition of our socket. Now, there's a long definition, and there are some features. We're going to talk about that later. But for now, let's uh, simply remember that it is an application protocol. OK, so what it means is it's not, um, it's not dealing with signals, like Wi-Fi signals. It's not doing NFC and other things. Um, it's an application level protocol, and it gives um, developers the freedom that they don't have to worry about uh, signals, they don't have to worry about uh, services, uh, sorry, IPs and ports, right? So they're addressing services devices. So that's what our socket is. But then I was thinking, how do I introduce um, a protocol in 30 minutes, right? It's mission impossible. So I was thinking of doing a demo. But for some reason, um, this demo cannot be set up here. Let's check. Oh, it can. So I tried uh, this demo upstairs in my room. It works. So let's hope that uh, this is going to work at, at here as well. So here's a simple demo setup. I have a Raspberry Pi device that has a camera attached to that. And it's rendering a service called uh, camera. It's taking a snapshot, and it's going to send the picture over. So the Raspberry Pi is connected to an RSocket broker. It's a broker, OK? That broker sits in public cloud, uh, on our own Alibaba cloud. And they're talking in our socket. I have another device, conveniently my laptop, that's going to consume this service. It's also connected to the broker and also going to the cloud. And it's going to uh, request that picture. So let's do that. All right. Hopefully that works. How long does it take? OK. Now let's see. Um, can we see? Uh, no. So I'm wondering, how do I do this? Uh, let me exit this first. And it's, and we are able to see a blurred picture with no good lightings. But you get the idea, right? You get the idea. That's how it works. OK. Now, seeing this very unimpressive and boring demo, you probably are wondering, what are we doing here, right? Why are we doing this? Because there are multiple ways to achieve the same thing. So bear with me. 
this demo, as boring as it is, it lays some foundations for the uh, talks, talking points later. Now, first thing we need to clarify is why do we need a broker, right? I have my device here, I have a, my laptop there, and our socket can easily um, make that point-to-point -point connection work. So why bother going all the way around? Well, because we are thinking of uh, the real use case, the real world use case, where it's not just two devices. So it's multiple devices talking to each other, and we need to figure out a way um, to connect them. And putting a broker in between simplifies that, and that's a proven topology. Uh, many other technologies use, use the same uh, deployment model. Um, but I, I need to clarify, though, that our socket is not a message bus. It's not a message queue. It's not uh, doing the pub sub style um, trafficking. So for a broker, for an R socket broker, it has to solve problems like service registry, service discovery, and load balancing. Right? And of course, load balancing is not the uh, within the boundary of the um, protocol itself, so we're not going to talk about it, but still we need to discover how we can do uh, discovery and um, registry. So any suggestions on how we do that, like any good packages that we normally use for service registry and um, discovery? Anyone heard of any good packages? There are a couple of them, right? So they are used. Uh, yes, yeah, service mesh. Thank you. Uh, service mesh uh, is is a technology that helps you to connect the services, similar to what we're doing here. Uh, but in particular, when you are talking about uh, registry and discovery, you probably need a third-party tool to help you. Right? There are like console and others, uh, very famous ones. But guess what? Our socket doesn't need any of those. Our socket does not need a third party tool. Uh, okay. So here's the code, um, in my code, uh, in the broker. This is a part where it returns um, to a connection. Uh, so it's going to return a handler, and i taken out all the other logics. But look at the two things. It registers and subscribes to two events, on success and on terminate. So when you are connecting, it's successful. There's an event getting triggered. And then you can do things. You can do things. And what do you do? You put the metadata of the service somewhere as a registry, right? And on terminating, what do you do? The same thing, you take out that metadata and say this service is no longer available. So by this simple piece of code, you can achieve a complicated third-party tool um, that can do. And how is that possible, right? How is that uh, enabled by RSocket? So RSocket has this feature, it's called connection-oriented, connection-oriented. So what does it mean? So basically, our socket, when you connect to it, uh, it's going to establish a long connection. It's going to establish a long connection, and it's, it's going to establish sessions. And then there's a thing called setup frame. We're going to talk about that later. But setup frame is first uh, when you are first connecting to the broker, uh, you're going to give out the metadata of what your device is about. You're going to give out the service name or whatever that's agreed upon. And your broker can then build a registry on top of it. And then you can later serve it. Right? And also, when you have multiple instances of the same service or device, uh, you can build algorithms of load balancing. You can build fancy algorithms of load balancing uh, with it. 
And of course, uh, we have this uh, events that's going to be sub subscribed by by the uh, broker or by the connection, so it knows when to uh, when the connection is available, when it's not. So we don't need all the other tools, and that's a nice part of our socket. It simplifies a lot of things. So the benefit of connection oriented is that obviously we just talk about no third party registry. Also, we don't need third party health check because we already know when the connection is up and or down, right? And a good part, and I think it's really useful for IoT devices, is it has session resumption. Session resumption. Uh, what that means is it, it's beyond connection resumption. So let's say my device got disconnected. Um, when you plug it back, it's going to resume the connection. That's normal. But let's say this device was transmitting 10 frames to uh, my laptop, and on number five, it stopped. Right? In the middle of number five, it stopped. So what resumption gives that, is gonna, it's going to resume transmitting from frame five because it was not complete. So that's what session resumption does, and it's really powerful and useful, especially for IoT devices, but for other uh, services as well. So this is one, uh, one feature that I think that's interesting coming out of this demo. Um, another, another feature um, we're going to talk about uh, is how we connect to the broker. Okay. So this is a code uh, on both of the devices, on both the uh, Raspberry Pi and my laptop. Uh, it connects to the public IP. Um, of the broker. Now, the second line is the set setup payload, setup frame we just talked about. It uh, contains the metadata of your device and your service, right? So um, it's just one time. And the third line, that's the interesting part. Uh, so it's going to be connecting to the broker. Now, he here's the thing. This Raspberry Pi is offering a service. Now, normally, when you are rendering a service, how do you do that? You open a port and you listen to it, right? You open a port and you listen to it. Now, in this case, we're not doing that. We connect to the broker, and then when there is, even without a broker, Let's say these two are connected together. Um, the Mac can just request uh, to the Raspberry Pi ask for that service. Okay, so that's a powerful feature of our socket. Because let's think about it for a minute. Um, when do we have the distinction between a client and a server? Meaning that communication has to be initiated from the client. Right, TCP does not have that distinction. TCP doesn't have it. Right, you have to open a port, yes, but the the one that opens the port can initiate the communication. Right, who does that? Client and server. HTTP does. Right, HTTP is designed for human beings sitting behind a browser and uh, requesting service from a server. So it is designed to protect the consumers that the server doesn't push unnecessary stuff to the browser. That's why it has this distinction. But, but that model of communication does not apply to applications communication. It doesn't apply to IoT communications, right? Why do we have to, in the last talk, I don't know, if you guys were here, but the, in the last talk, the one before me, um, the professor was talking about how every time you restart, you need to figure out the IP address. Right? That's painful because you need to figure out the IP address and you need to give out a port so that you can listen to you can listen to that port and establish a service. 
right? So this feature, what we're talking about, is called bidirectional communication. So bidirectional communication gives us certain benefits. Of course, for IoT devices, it's huge, that security. When you listen to a port, um, there will be attacks. Right? When you don't listen to a port, you don't have that attack. Um, and IP management, right? it's hard for IoT devices. It's even hard for edge devices. Um, I, ha I was working on something a couple of weeks ago that uh, we need to come up with a, a list of IP addresses. So each time that the edge device, the server starts, it's going to have the same static IP address, which is against designs of many things. But um, above all, it's great for connection management. So you don't have to worry about upstream connection, downstream connection, it's one connection. So that's the power of our socket. So we, we've gone through two major features of our socket, um, connection oriented and uh, bidirectional communications. So what else is available, right? Um, so that's the four points on the first slide. Uh, so let's talk about the features that's available for our, our socket. Our socket is a binary protocol. It's not a text-based protocol, so it's more efficient. And it's message-based protocol. So what that means is it has message information uh, embedded in the same type of payload as your other payload. Uh, for example, we just talked about setup frame, right? Uh, we're going to talk about all the events, right? How, how does it check for the liveness? So there's a keep a live frame, and there are other frames. All those commands are in the same format as the others. It all appear as the same uh, frame format. So that's a message-based protocol. And we just talked about bi bidirectional and connection-oriented. So these three things, bidirectional, multiplex, and connection-oriented, makes it really powerful. Now, of course, we, it's hard for me to demo the um, multiplex. Um, I, don't, I cannot think of a simple demo that can do that, but um, all these three make that really powerful. And, of course, there's uh, another point of the four interaction models where, that we have not talked about. And here they are. So the founders or the creators of, of this protocol, they were thinking of the patterns of communications between applications, between IoT devices, and they came up with different patterns for different models. One is our familiar request response, right? That's, we, all, we all know what it is. Uh, the second one is fire and forget. Fire and forget is when you uh, send something over, you don't care about the return results, right? Uh, for example, uh, if you're writing something to the logs, uh, you don't really care if it's received or not. So that's one uh, use case. And also, I think for people who are familiar with MQTT, there's also that feature. And the third part is request stream. Request stream is when you send a request, you get a stream of responses, not just one, you have plenty. And the last one is a channel, that's a bidirectional streams. So the thing to remember is, even though there are four different types of interactions, you only need one connection. It's that long connection you established at the beginning that's gonna serve all of them. Okay, you can have them together, you can have one by one, doesn't matter, but that's, that connection is gonna stay there. And if it is disconnected, it's gonna resume. Okay, so one connection multiplexed. So that's how multiplex works, right? So you have different types of streams. Uh, it's going to be using the same socket. So we've talked about the major features of, of our socket, right? And now let's drill down a little bit more, and that is. Um, what's the design principles behind it, right? Other than making it convenient and adaptive to all the um, application communication models, 
uh, what's the design principles um, behind it. And that's a, a tough topic, I would say. But let's start with the name. Uh, we know what socket is. What does R stand for? R stands for reactive, reactive streams. I, I'm not sure if we all have heard of it, but it's a programming model that's been around for some time. Now, I'm not going to go too deep into that because that's going to stir a lot of debates and whatnot. But the two major design principles, and I think it's the design principles for all the um, distributed environment or architecture, is it, it focuses on asynchronous and non-blocking I.O. Asynchronous and non-blocking I.O. Um, I mean, it's not hard to uh, figure that out because you have things that you don't have control over. So the best way to deal with it and make sure you're resilient and high performance is to get around it, right? So you kick the one that's blocked out and you make sure the one that's not blocked uh, can get in. So that's how you do it. Now, there are different ways to implement asynchronous and non-blocking IOs, right? It's not just reactive. Um, that's the only one. There are different ways to do it. But what uh, makes reactive streams stand out is the concept called back pressure. So what is back pressure? Um, let's go back to asynchronous and non-blocking for a minute. Now, how do you implement that? How do you implement asynchronous and non-blocking I.O.? You need to query your, your operating system, right, to know which processes are blocked, which ones are ready, right? You need to do that. Now, the problem is, what about the devices that's not in your control, right? What about uh, the other devices, other services, that you cannot query their operating system you cannot do that, right? You cannot submit, uh, you cannot subscribe to an event, say, hey, um, my, the operating system on the Pi, tell me when this thread is ready. You cannot do that. So you need the measurement to know um, when it's ready. So that's what back pressure is. Back pressure is the consumer telling the producer, I am ready, give me a couple of frames. That's what it does, nothing else. It's a very simple, yet it is very genius design because what are the other alternatives, right? Either you do long pooling, are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? Think about that. Effective? No. Or you do the other way. The consumer is saying, I'm busy, I'm busy, I'm busy. Does it work? Of course not. Because when you're busy, probably you're already blocked. How do you send out that signal, right? So. This is a genius way of design. And I love this picture, these two pictures, of how uh, it describes um, back pressure. So when you don't have back pressure, when you have a surge of traffic, uh, that's what's going to happen uh, to the man. And then when you have back pressure, even though she's drinking from a bottle, imagine that's a hose, and she's saying, give me like two tablespoons. Right? That's what it does. That's what back pressure does. Now, back pressure, our sock, uh, sorry, reactive streams had, has been around for a while. This concept has been around. So what does our socket do to make a difference? Right? So it turns out that back pressure, um, when it's original, originally developed, uh, it's, it's not enforced on network. So what our socket guarantees is end-to-end -end back pressure. So what does that mean? Let's say you have more than two devices, like five devices. One of them is slow. You need to inform the other four, right? Whether they are in parallel or they are in the chain, you need to let the others know. If you are relying on TCP to deliver that back pressure, it's hop to hop. Right? It's hop to hop. TCP has a sliding window, but it's at transport layer. It doesn't know your application status. It cannot query backwards. 
So it can only do hop to hop. And our socket can do it through message-based protocol. That information, that back pressure information is encrypted in, in the request uh, frame and it goes around the whole system. So it enables end-to-end -end flow control or back pressure. So that is, and that's how much I'm gonna talk about reactive in general, because I know it's, it's a broad topic, but that's the principle behind our socket, is to ensure your asynchronous and non-blocking I.O. goes all over the system end to end. All right, um, so next topic, and that, that's a, a little bit more controversial, is uh, comparisons with other technologies. And the first one is uh, what I always get asked, um, the difference from gRPC, because gRPC is very popular as well. So what gRPC has, it has two parts. It has an RPC part. It has a protocol part, right? Uh, what our socket is, is it is a protocol. So it is not an RPC layer. Um, actually, it works with uh, protobuf. So if you have generated your proto files, uh, cool, you can, you, you can just port it over. You don't have to regenerate them. Um, and it supports other um, encoding mechanisms as well. Uh, so now let's talk about R socket versus HTTP, which um, is a little bit controversial. Uh, so over the years, we've seen HTTP2, and now there's HTTP3, and there's a lot of great features envisioned. There's a lot of great uh, improvements that has been done. Uh, we've seen like server push, we've seen multiplex, we've seen, now HTTP2 is our, also binary uh, protocol. So we've seen a lot of these things going on, right? And HTTP3 is more ambitious. And you, you can see that they are, they're, they're doing something that we, uh, our circuit has already implemented. And so that's a great thing and, and we like it because it also not only validates uh, our circuit's idea, but it also means that the communication model has shifted from the original human browser to web server to um, application, uh, application communications. So that's a great thing, but but um, here's the thing, um, HTTP is a popular protocol. It has to make everyone happy, right? It has to make everyone happy, which means it's really hard to become truly reactive. Now let's take one example. Let's say you, um, uh, there's a sale, there's a flash sale online, and you want to buy something and it's only like one minute. So you put this thing on the shopping cart, you wait for the time to come, and if this whole system was implemented in our socket, what's gonna happen? So you're gonna wait, because that checkout button will not appear until the web server gives it a green light, right? So that's not the user experience you, you want. That's not the user experience the sellers will want. What they want is you keep clicking, keep trying, and only like 10% of them get uh, the flash sale deal. That, that's what they want, right? So in other words, our socket kills the fun, right? It kills all the enthusiasm uh, when there's human uh, involved. And HTTP, though, has to support that. So HTTP cannot be truly uh, reactive. It cannot truly embrace that high performance um, asynchronous non-blocking I.O. It has to do, so imagine that user experience, what it does to the system load, right? It creates a lot of junk connections. It's disconnected, it's, it's a mess. But that's where it is right now. So. Our socket is not trying to please everyone. 
It's only designed for certain use cases, and we try to make those use cases work better. Uh, HTTP is well uh, established. It has to support everyone. So that's the difference. Now, another comparison we always have to do is against um, message queues, uh, especially uh, in other talks, uh, people always ask for Kafka. Um, because I think uh, I was mentioning the brokerage um, model, deployment model, and also, um, also because I mentioned there's a message-based uh, protocol. Uh, but let's take a look uh, at what happens when you have a surge of traffic and there's an imbalance between the, uh, the, the consumer and producer, right? So the left would be your MQTT, that's uh, anticipated, ex expected. Uh, the middle one would be our socket, right? So that's what we have explained. So the right one is a little bit interesting. This is Kafka. So what Kafka does is it's gonna cache all the data and then it's gonna uh, still use the same rate, uh, the rate that the consumer can accept uh, to send the traffic over. So think about that. Um, I mean, I work for, for a cloud vendor and I love customers to buy storage and, and memory-based cache. I love that. But this solution wouldn't scale, right? Eventually, you're going to run out of your storage or memory or whatever, right? So right now, if you use Kafka to um, connect your IoT devices, there's already limitations, right? Because of the partition it does, it cannot uh, accept too many topics. So there's a limitation on the topics, and then there's a limitation on the device numbers. So that's where we are today in terms of in terms of um, comparison uh, with MQTT and Kafka. But uh, by, by no means are we diminishing their, their existence or, or trying to make them look bad. In fact, we're working, uh, so we're working on a couple of projects. One is adapters or gateways to MQTT. One is uh, the gateways to Kafka. So uh, as long as our devices can, can be reactive, uh, we can have a better um, performance, we can have a better architecture, and it's gonna benefit everyone. So that's pretty much the content that I would like to share. In terms of RSocket itself, it's an open source project. Uh, it starts from a spec. Right, so, the, so the founders actually saw this through. They were um, thinking of different uh, use cases for communication models, and they wrote it down. So there's a um, protocol, RSocket protocol spec, and there's a routing spec, which is for broker. And you can check out uh, the website. Uh, welcome to um, join us, to, to join us as uh, committers, contributors. Um, Right now, it has different SDKs. Um, there's Java, there's C++, there's um, uh, JavaScript, uh, .NET, and there's a Golang. And we're working on Rust. So there are different uh, languages that support it. And the exciting thing is we're becoming a member of Linux Foundation. We're gonna have a um, sub-foundation under Linux Foundation. And that announcement would be next Tuesday also. So you might uh, get that notification if you subscribe to that. Um, and yeah, during the conference, we might have some release, uh, press releases. Uh, I'm not sure yet, but hopefully that's gonna be enough uh, information to get you guys the motivation to try it out. All right, so that's uh, what I have for today. Any questions, comments, feedbacks? Yes, please go ahead. Uh, could you talk about scaling the broker to say a, a massive fleet of IoT devices? Uh, you clearly couldn't do it all with one VM or one box. Exactly. Uh, how do you guys manage that? 
Fantastic, thank you. So you're thinking ahead. Uh, so the question was, how do you scale the brokers so it can uh, connect multiple uh, thousands or millions of devices? So there are a couple of things. One is remember that one device has only one connection, and the connection is pretty uh, small. So uh, we've tried very conservatively, one box can, uh, can easily uh, support more than 10,000 devices. Uh, so that's a, uh, that's a cool fact. Uh, another thing is, uh, so you have, when you have a cluster of brokers, uh, you, ha you need to have a mechanism to synchronize them. And that's, um, that's something that has to be done either at com uh, commercial level or you have to somewhat um, customize it. Like, right now we have a basic uh, broker that's gonna be open source. There are commercial grade um, clusters of brokers that's available uh, done by a startup. Uh, so that actually you can, you can basically have a cluster of a uh, couple uh, hundred, uh, if not more. So what it does is it opens another port uh, to each other and then they are basically exchanging information using UDP, but it's still on our socket. So they, they're exchanging um, information in the same asynchronous and non-blocking way uh, so that it doesn't block too much of their, their performances. So they have, I think they have benchmarked a, a couple hundred brokers in a cluster, and that's, that's fine. Uh, other questions, yes? Mm -hmm. uh, and edge so is this meant to be for uh, device running Linux or can it be down to the peripheral uh, uh, small enough that it can be uh, done in a microcontroller? Um, I'm not sure about how small the devices you're talking about, but so the question is, uh, does it only run on like Linux enabled uh, devices or it can be uh, smaller? So it really depends on your device. So right now we have SDKs, right, written in those languages. So your, your device has somehow to be able to compile and run those code, right? You have to be able to run those code that's generated, the binaries that's generated. Uh, you can. You can compile it somewhere else and then load it. I don't know if uh, that's gonna make things easier, but um, as a protocol itself, our socket is not just for IOTs. Like I said, it's good for microservices. It's good for um, any distributed environment. It's good for uh, devices as well, but um, it's not limited to devices. It's as long as it can be, uh, accepted uh, on the device, right? So before uh, coming here, I was trying to set up the demo on, a, on one of those um, surveillance cameras so that we can have a stream of videos. But then I realized that I cannot program on those things and it's already pre-programmed. So if the device uh, manufacturers support this, then we, we definitely can have a better um, uh, use case on those devices. Any other questions? Nope. All righty. Thank you very much. And thank you. Thank you.